Good evening, uh, members, and welcome to our Alsace Masterclass. Over the next hour or so, we will be discussing this, this beautiful wine region of northern France. We'll cover the, the rich history of the region, what's happening currently, and maybe even a little bit into the glimpse into the future. We'll look at the huge diversity of soils, of terroir, great varieties, and of course, then the wine styles that have produced all of this through the lens of one of the region's most um, iconic, most important and celebrated uh, estates, Famille Hugel, of which Jean-Frédéric, you are 13th generation, am I right? Thank you. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Part of it, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm often describing myself as the tip of the iceberg, so I'm the one, uh, the face that is the most familiar to our customers around the world, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but uh, that, that also includes my, my cousin, my uncle, who's still active despite being retired. The retirement is a very abstract concept in the family, I guess. So, uh, so yes, 12th and 13th generation uh, in, uh, in the commands of the, of the, of the house now. No. Yeah. Brilliant. Now, before I pass the, uh, the proverbial microphone across to you, Joe, to, to sort of launch the event uh, proper, uh, members, as usual, just a little bit of housekeeping from me. So firstly, if you do encounter any technical uh, difficulties, any connectivity issues, do please let me know. You can do that one of three ways. We can... Uh, email me tastings at thewinesociety.com or within Zoom, you can uh, click on the reactions tab, uh, raise your hand. I'll see that and I can direct message you and we'll find out what's what's wrong. Otherwise, you can message me directly via the chat function um, and you can let me know what's happening um, and I'll do my very best to resolve the issue. Talking of the chat, as usual, we'd love to hear where you're all joining us from. I can see one or two of you have already told us not just where you are, but also um, what you've got in your glass. And as we mentioned in the email, the tasting at uh, the event tonight's not talking about specific wines, but uh, if you have anything in your glass, and we certainly have, well, Joe and I certainly have something in our glasses here, we may well come to talk a little bit about some of Hugel's wines throughout the evening. Um, and if you have any questions for Jean Frederic or for Joe, please do pop them into the QA and I'll do my best to get to them. Uh, it might be, I suppose, at this point, Jean Frey, just to explain where you are before we. Start yes, moving. maybe a bit of context will be <laughs> will be important. Uh, my apologies in advance. I uh, I was supposed to uh, be perfectly on time at, uh, live from the winery, and then uh, and then a late arrival of the aircraft decided otherwise. So I'm from uh, I'm live from my local airport. You couldn't make it better. Uh, local airport in uh, in Basel, so you'll get you'll be hearing some announcements. Uh, so in case you have any luggage, do not accept any belongings from anyone uh, in uh, French and in uh, in uh, German and English. Excellent. That is the German version. <laughs> but uh, Joe, uh, over to you. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you, John Frederick. I can't see whether my camera is working. Not that I mind if it's not. Um, uh, you are, yes. I, it's there. Okay, fine. that's fine. Right. So, a uh, huge thank you, everyone, for joining us, and a particular thank you to John Frederick for joining us from Basel Airport. Um, John Frederick has been uh, travelling quite a bit recently. Um, he was in the UK with us not very long ago, only a couple of weeks ago, um, and had a, a bit of a nightmare journey home. He also spent his birthday with us in the UK as a result. Um, so he's had a bit of a time of it. So this is really above and beyond the call of duty, Jean Frederic. Thank you so much. And, uh, You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Gil and I are lucky enough to have a glass of wine, which you don't. So, um, as well as I, hopefully a lot of members do too. So we're toasting you. We're we're very much thinking of you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, so the Hugel family uh, really needs little introduction in the context of Alsace. The name is synonymous with Alsace. Um, as Gil uh, alluded to, a very, very long history in the region established there from 1639. We yes. think we have a big birthday to celebrate uh, with 150 years this year. Um, so there's tremendous history um, in a very, very beautiful part of the world. And I think um, jean Frederic's going to share some images with us. We found at our, our recent tasting in Bristol, where, where jean Frederic joined us, that a lot of people had been to the region. So it, it'll be interesting to, to, to hear from you whether you've actually been to Alsace before. Um, but certainly, it seems to be one of those regions that once you go, you, you get the bug, you're hooked. Um, and it's no surprise, really, given the, the, the spread of wines available. 
Wired Society has worked with, with Hugel for many, many years, not least with the Societies Van Alsace. And I haven't been able to find out quite when we started. Marcel thinks it might have been, the first vintage might have been 1992. Or I that might have been so. the first vintage with only noble grapes, because he thinks we began with a blend of Silvana and Chasla, which is interesting. But anyway... It doesn't really matter how long, it's just that it's a very, very long partnership. And of course, with the exhibition, Gewürz Traminer as well, amongst many other wonderful wines, which I think Jean-Frédéric will go on to, to talk to us a bit about. So I'm I'm going to hand over to Jean-Frédéric. Jean he's he's far more qualified than me to, to talk about it. So welcome again, Jean-Frédéric. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You. Um, well, uh, of course, we have a we have a chat. I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing uh, you're you're following us for from uh, from all parts of the country. So uh, uh, do not hesitate to jump in at any point with questions. We're obviously going to to bounce on it uh, and and try to answer as 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 many as possible. Um, it's um, well, first of all, it's the first time I do a masterclass without a glass in my hand. So I hope I'll be as good <laughs> without a glass in my hand as as with it. Um, but but the idea really is uh, is um, to give you a, a first glimpse at at the region and what makes the wines of the of the region so so special. Uh, first of all, what what sounds very obvious to say, but but is becoming less and less, is that we're a white. Wine specialist region. We're a region that has always specialized in wine with the the. The particularity that we're a northern climate of France, where we're the northernmost uh, wine region of France, we are going to exclude Champagne in this in this case because Champagne is a very particular mode of elaboration. But but uh, in in um, in a situation where where we are a northern climate, which is already quite quite unique for us, with on top of that a semi continental climate, most of France is either Mediterranean or or has an oceanic uh, an ocean influence which is not our case in, in our case. And, and this is why climate change, by the way, is such a, is such a topic in, in our area because we don't have that make it mitigating and, and, and um, that, that cushion of, of influence of an ocean. And, and when the climate gets warmer, we are, we're amongst the first ones to, to notice uh, this being so far rather in a, in a positive way, but, but possibly, uh, possibly more, uh, Possibly more challenging in the in the future. So I I, I have prepared a, a few slides, very very few slides, um, but the first one is is um, is uh, going to be uh, probably Gil. You can you can you can put one on. Um, the 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 first um, the first slide being uh, being uh, a little bit related to to history. Um, we Alsace is by no means a new wine region. Uh, it we're we're very like like very often like like most cases in 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 Europe we we are a region that that inherited the vine from from the Romans. There were already uh, wines produced before that from uh, from Silvestris grapes, uh, some from Silvestris vines, so wild vines basically. But the, the the grape wines were basically brought by the Romans. The Romans were were traveling, uh, well, concurring ac across Europe. And they were traveling with their with their vines because uh, the 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 daily ration of a of a Roman soldier was basically a liter and a half of wine a day, uh, which you can imagine. Uh, and and we've been talking uh, a lot about stretches in the in the um, in the the the, um, the the supply lines with the recent conflict in Ukraine, but. Uh, the supply lines are, are everything when it comes to marching with an army. And so when you when it's in the contract of your soldiers that they're supposed to have wine, that's a lot of wine to carry. That's a lot of wine to carry with you. And so everywhere they settled, they established viticulture and they established viticulture on the sides of the Rhine uh, close to 2000 years ago. So Alsace has been for the past 2000 years, a wine producing region at different scales with, with different... Um, with different uh, volumes produced, the picture, the the, the image, actually, it's it's a drawing that you that you've seen was was actually um, a, a a drawing of Rigvir in the 1600s. So this is Rigvir in 1643. Um, uh, 
what you can see around there, well, first of all, the village is walled because, because having a specialty wine production, we had the issue of having uh, neighbors that were sometimes willing to drink wine without necessarily having, necessarily having to pay for it. So that was something we settled with high walls and defensive, uh, defensive, uh, defensive walls. But everything you can see around it is basically vineyard sites, uh, vineyard sites, and and this is more or less the accomplishment of of viticulture because Rigvia was basically built. It's one of those architectural gems. If you've had a chance to to come to Alsace, you will you will it will strike you in, strike you instantly. It is one of those places where wine is absolutely everywhere, history is absolutely everywhere, culture is absolutely everywhere. Uh, you, you you can't avoid it. All of the buildings that that constitute the the architecture of Rigvia. First of all, what strikes is the uniformity, and and all of them more or less were built late 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. So so around the time uh, at the latest when when this drawing was made, and a lot of those buildings are most of those buildings are are still standing. Rigvia was built with the money of wine. Basically, it, it, it gained its its wealth from from viticulture. And, and this is, once again, the figures are, are important. Points of reference are important. Um, you have to imagine that Alsace was, between the 1300s and the 1600s, the shining star of Europe, the number one wine region of Europe, both in terms of volume and price. The, the wines of Alsace were the most expensive wines in the world. We, we know that from the, from the trade records of Strasbourg. Where uh, where the taxes were collected, uh, so when you collect taxes, you you want to uh, make sure that uh, that you know uh, how much and how much means how much is in volume and how much in value. This is what what allows you to that allows us to know the price, allows us to know the volumes that were traded. Alsace in the early 1600s was trading. I mean, exporting, trading so further north than Strasbourg, which means already exports, um, more than 1 million hectoliters of wine, which is more than today's total production for the region. So a, a major uh, wine producing region, definitely, and with very high prices all of the north of Europe, England already at the time, thank you very much, but also uh, Scandinavia, uh, uh, most parts of the Hanseatic cities and and, and the Dutch merchants and and that... that um, that trading class that was no longer the nobleness, but in the north of Europe, it was it was really a there was really a bourgeoisie that was that was starting to um, that was starting to establish, and and all the way to Nizhny Novgorod in Russia, the 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 the, the royal court of Russia, etc. All of the north of Europe was was drinking wines of Alsace, and this is what drove the Alsace viticulture for a long, long time. And actually, this this drawing that you've seen, 1643, it's it's contemporary of when my uh, when my family established in Rivier. it's it's we were actually in in business for four years when uh, when this uh, when this drawing was made. So it, it shows you a little bit how how important viticulture is, of course, in Alsace, but also in our in our family culture. We've been we've been producing wine for for uh, longer than than the U.S. have existed, for example, and and um, and it's uh, it's uh, it's both a pride, of course, but but also a a particular responsibility because we have we have gained over over the years a, a certain customer base which you can't afford to to disappoint. So uh, I, I um I have uh, I have uh, jumped into uh, into uh, something that is that is greater than myself. We I guess in life we all dream about something greater than ourselves, and 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 in our case it's it's wine, and and it's uh, we have uh, we have a. Uh, an opportunity to uh, to do a, a profession that is that is uh, absolutely fascinating in a place that has seen the birth of our of our business and our and our wine adventure. Um, so let's jump into um, into the wines, into the grapes, and and once again I'm going to refer to um, I'm going to refer to the to the 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 history of uh, of. Uh, of, of Alsace, and we're going to go back to more or less the 1600s, because Alsace has always more or less, and, and depending on depending on the eras and the times, the, made a, a difference between what we call the noble grapes and the more the more humble wines, the more humble humble wines that were that were more simple productions. Um, 
and and this is still something that is that is existing at the moment in Alsace. We still we still consider four grapes to be uh, to be noble and and uh, and Sylvaner, Chasla, uh, 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 Pinot Noir for for some reason uh, would be uh, would be grape varieties that are that are considered uh, that are considered more hum more humble. So Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, uh, Chasla, Sylvaner uh, would be uh, would be of, of more humble uh, humble. Uh, uh, um, personalities and build up and and this was always the case because there was already in the 1600s a very strong difference made between grape varieties that typically would produce wines with more aging potential and wines with aging potential because Alsace is a region that produces white wines with very high aging potential um, it was a uh, they were the wines that were exported the exported they were the wines that were that were traded um, and traded quite far away, as I as I just mentioned. So they needed to be able to handle uh, to handle the the, the trip. I, I always I'm I'm always fascinated how uh, history fascinates the way the way a, a culture eats and drinks. And for example, the, the the markets where we've we, we were trading with in um, in the 1600s are still. Very very strong markets for the consumption of Alsace wines. The highest consumption of Alsace wines per capita is actually not in France, but it's in Denmark, for example. So all of those, Scandinavia has always been a very strong market of ours. So all of these northern countries have always more or less consumed, consumed Alsace wines. And John Frederick, so this, is there a, sorry to interrupt, but is, this, is there a, um, is it documented what the style of the wines were? What were, were would the wines, partly to help them travel, would the wines have had a certain level of sweetness back then? Um, it's it's very hard to tell for sure. Okay. Most likely, yes. We actually have a, a pretty good testimony from it, which is uh, which is actually the oldest wine in the world. The oldest wine in the world is an Alsace wine. It's it's kept in the Hospice de Strasbourg cellars. It's from 1451, if I remember well, but don't uh, don't uh, don't take it for for granted. So uh, uh, worth double checking um, the exact vintage, but it's from the 1400s, without a doubt. Um, and clearly, that wine had residual sugar. The problem is, you know, it's it's always the overrepresentation of age-worthy wines. So when when you talk to a to a few people, they'll tell you that they always assume the wines become sweeter as they age because all of the old wines that they've tried were sweet wines well actually sweet wines age much longer so of course this would be uh, um, a bias it's probably a bias on our side with the fact that that the wines that were fully fermented and that were that were picked early enough to make a dry wine would probably last less long than those those supercharged age-worthy wines, straw wines, because straw wines were, were, were produced uh, at the time in, in the region. So people produced wine with the intention to make late harvest and, uh, and, uh, and sweet wines from, from Passriage. So we know that there were some sweet wines produced. We just do not quite know to what, what extent. And, and obviously, chemically, they, they, they wouldn't have been able to test the wines anyway. So uh, um, that is extremely, extremely hard to know very very hard to know but we know which grapes were planted which is which is quite interesting and gives us a little bit of a of an idea of of uh, of what the wines could be like let's say and at the time muscat muscat is probably one of the oldest existing wines the existing grape varieties the the, the romans already uh, already were uh, were growing muscat so it's one of the probably oldest unaltered uh, grape varieties that uh, definitely the oldest in Alsace, but one of the oldest unaltered grape varieties in the world. Um, and then Gentil Blanc, Gentil Rose, what they used to call Gentil Blanc, Gentil Rose, which are, uh, which are apparently more or less uh, Savagnin grapes. So that, that would be, that would have been Savagnin. Riesling was, form was formalized in the 1500s. So in the 1500s, 1551, I think, there are written traces of a, uh, of, uh, of a Riesling, a grape being called Riesling for the first time. Probably the grape existed before. And you have to understand that at that time, there was no formalism when it comes to grapes. So probably the same grape could be called a different way in two different valleys or two different villages. So it's very, very hard to trace them back perfectly. But but uh, there's a first mention made in Kinsheim, made of Rigvir, so Kinsheim Morin, uh, first reference made to Riesling. And, and that's our neighboring village. So very likely already at the time, some Riesling was planted in Rigvir. Uh, so we have 
we have Traminer, we have Muscat, we have Riesling in the 1500s. So that's more or less our, our, our current grapes. We're very lucky that they didn't, didn't disappear. They, they actually were on the, on, the, on the verge of disappearing in the, in the early 1900s. And they've been saved and they've been safeguarded by, by some uh, forward thinking growers that, that thought that these high quality grape varieties would be the way, uh, would be the way forward. Sorry, I can't hear you. Maybe you're maybe you're muted. I beg your pardon. Yeah. So yep. that, those those varieties, that that range of varieties, became you know the essence of what what we we came to know as Alsace, which was uh, unusually in France at the time, led at by the end, varietal as opposed to led by blend. Imagine that at the end of World War One, it was four percent of the acreage. So we're back from from from. It's, it's almost miraculous that those grapes are, are back. But yes, the, these, are, uh, these are what really, to understand that, you really have to go back a little bit, once again, back to history with the fact that Alsace, at the end of World War I, was producing a huge majority of hybrids. Pretty much viticulture almost disappeared in Europe. Huh? You, you have to put things in perspective. Viticulture almost disappeared. Phylloxera had, had almost wiped out all of the production and most, and cricket, cryptogamic uh, uh, so fungal diseases, uh, mildew idiom essentially, that were, that were coming from the US as well, from the American continent. Uh, they, they almost disappeared. They almost caused bit culture to disappear in Europe. And so at that stage, you, you, have, um, you, you have to imagine that at the end of World War I, they are 4%. At the, edge of, at the end of World War II, the vineyards of Alsace still produce about 35, almost 40% of hybrids. So what, what, we, what, we, <laughs> what we call in Alsacien, Dry men are vine, you know, dry men are vine, wines for three men, one that drinks it and two to carry him because he's going to faint. The wines were so bad, he, was, he, would, probably, he would probably faint. Uh, uh, so so the, the wines were of, of such poor quality, the wines from hybrids were of such poor quality. And this is why, you know, when you read in the newspapers that hybrids are making a, news, a huge comeback, uh, take it with a grain of salt. We've tried before. It, it hasn't been a, an, an incredible success. So hybridated with, with our, our domestic grapes and then came, then came uh, uh, grafting. And, and my family has been, uh, especially Emile, Frédéric Emile was, was instrumental in convincing other growers to, um, to actually, uh, to actually ad adopt, uh, adopt grafting. And so you're back from a, from a situation where more or less the grape variety. I hope you can hear me. Um, hope at, at the stage where the grape variety was the defining factor of was was the significant factor of a greater wine. It was not a blend or a co-fermentation of nobody knows what's in it and probably still a lot of hybrids and low quality uh, grape varieties. This was a noble wine made from noble grapes, and this was the main the main differentiating factor in Alsace, which explains why today Alsace produces a huge, a tremendous majority of, of, of single, grape, uh, single grape wines. The fact that today we speak about blends again in Alsace only comes from the fact that those poor quality, high yielding, uh, uh, very poor wines in effect are, are gone. They don't exist anymore. So we are back to, um, to a situation after World War II where Alsace becomes one of those shining stars of the wine world. And, and, um, and the region is getting a lot of traction, a lot of success with grapes that, that today, uh, that today we, are, we are very proud to grow and that today sound, sound like, uh, like obvious, uh, obvious choices for the produce of the, of the region. So the four noble grapes, so the four noble grapes, Riesling, Pinot Gris, Gewurz, Traminer, Muscat. Muscat's very often forgotten. Don't forget Muscat. It's going to be a very important grape in, the ver in a very near future. Uh, uh, we estimate in the family that Muscat, Muscat Petit Grain, Muscat d'Alsace, will, uh, will be one of the big survivors of the, of the, climate, change, uh, of the climate change situation. So we're, we're, we're planting some Muscat in the, in the vineyards at the moment. I have to say that that's music to my ears. I'm, I'm biased, but I love Muscat. Um, and actually, uh, out in Alsace only last week, um, the uh, of course, Moscow was being served because it's asparagus season, you know, lots yes. of really fresh asparagus, local asparagus. 
the white asparagus, different from our green asparagus, which we're still waiting for here, but we have that joy to come. So uh, yes, definitely the Muscat will be coming out for that. It's probably 50% of our yearly consumption of Muscat done in, uh, in a matter of three or four weeks in the, in the region. So uh, practically Muscat, uh, if, if Muscat cannot disappear, as long as we can grow asparagus, there will be Muscat produced in Alsace. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to save the grape. Um, and, uh, and so those, those four noble grapes, the one thing to remember and the reason why they are considered as noble, first of all, they, they make wines at age better. It's, 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 a, it's a fact if correlated properly with the, with the vineyard site, they will make wines that age much better. And we, you, you can call me old fashioned if you want, but, uh, but to me, the, the, um, the, common, the common denominator of all great wines and the one, that the one thing that defines a great wine is its ability to age. Um, and then those are grapes that are allowed in Grand Cru vineyards. So the Grand Cru uh, um, places, the Grand Cru vineyard sites of, uh, of Alsace are, well, 51 at the moment. Uh, um, those four grapes are the ones that you can officially and, and legally grow on those vineyard sites with Silvana and Pinot Noir doing uh, doing a little bit of a of a of a of a change, but that you can grow on each uh, on each of the Grand Crus, and um, and then those are the four grapes that you can produce as late harvest wines, as, as Bonnage Tardif wines. With my my great uncle Johnny was instrumental in in putting in place, and and which um, which have been uh, well, I guess Joe, I I think it's your choice for the for the session, right? Sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> I caught you I'm, by surprise. I'm, in, I'm enjoying the uh, the 150th cuvee actually, rather than ah, okay. uh, run, rather than the Bon Marche Tardif. But it's it's intriguing when you you know talking about the the wines with residual sugar and fascinating to think that it was as recently as the 80s that those appellations were approved. Um, you know the, the the fact that your family was so instrumental in making that happen, but. Yeah, I just find it astonishing that they weren't. It's, it, uh, it wasn't formalized. They, they weren't the, official. The, exactly. They, it wasn't, wasn't formal. It wasn't that they weren't made, of course, but it but they weren't. The, official. the wines the wines existed, but you have to really put things back in perspective. We're talking about the time when quality viticulture was almost non-existent. So those high risk, because these would be high risk today. Today we still say that it's high risk, but honestly, we look we we watch the weather forecast. And, and we have 14 days decently accurate weather forecast. So the risk is very minimal, let's be honest. When, when um, you have to imagine producing those wines in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, people were just looking at the sky and going, okay, today's a good day, tomorrow's gonna be the same. That was, that was and, and that's actually the best, uh, the best uh, if you want to know what the weather is tomorrow, the best, uh, the best assumption is same as, uh, same as yesterday, you're gonna be 50% uh, right. 50% um, of the time right. And so that was, uh, that was obviously a tremendous risk to take, which basically meant that most producers did not make these, these wines. We, we actually produced them, but more as, um, it, we, we've always produced them in the family. And we have some, some amazing examples in the library from 1865, from 1900, from 1921, from uh, uh, 1934, 1934, which was, the wine, uh, the, the only selection Grenoble in the cellar, in the Hugel cellars for 40 years until, until, uh, until 1976. So it's, it's uh, no, for 30 years until 61. Um, so, so, um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it, it, it's wines with a major significance in our family. It, it, these have always been wines with an, an incredible significance in our family. Uh, and in the 80s, when those wines were formalized, there were only two producers that still made them. It was, it was Schlumberger and Hugel. We were the only two producers that still were trying to produce, uh, to produce these wines. And, and, um, and wines of Botrytis were known and people knew that it was a possibility, but nobody was willing to take the risk. Why would you take the risk of losing your entire crop to make a wine that nobody knows about? And, and it's really 76 that changed the game. 76 was a a big well a big crop everything's relative but uh, a, a, a volume produced a volume of sweet wines that was marketable that was that was at a, at a scale where you could actually actively 
sell it. And, and, and it was not, no longer a, a family secret that you only sold to your best friends and, and a few people in your area and, and maybe a few, a few visitors of, of a, a few uh, uh, wealthy visitors, but it was something that you could actually export and, and, and start building a distribution with. And, and these wines have made us famous. And I, I assume that you had the good summer that we had here. I remember as a teenager, 1976 was the most wonderful hot, dry summer. So presumably the conditions were good for making sweet wine. Yes, yes, yes. And, and actually we're, we're good almost exclusively to make sweet wines. The, the, the dry wines are holding up okay, but it wasn't considered a, a tremendous vintage for, for dry wines. They were ripe, but they, they do not quite have the texture or the, or the, or the freshness. They're, they're, they, 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 they were drought issues, but everything with botrytis was just absolutely magical. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a, of a legendary story in our, in our family that um, when, uh, when, uh, when Johnny was, uh, after, after the whole day of work, when the grapes were in the press and the press was 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 put in place was johnny put on the press and his father came next to him and said um, don't screw that one up <laughs> don't screw that one up uh reasoning sgn 76 is probably the most uh, the most legendary wine we've 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 produced uh and and uh and uh and it, everybody knew what they had in their hands you know at that stage it's it, it doesn't come as a surprise. You, you don't go to the cellar and taste it and, oh, wow, you know what the grapes look like. You know what the vintage looks like. It, it was an exceptional vintage. Everybody knew about it. And, and I, I, I envy the, their excitement when, when, they, uh, when they, they saw the vintage unfold. I really envy their excitement because there's nothing better than a great vintage. I can tell you that every good memory that I have from a harvest was in a great year. Uh, people are in a better mood and, and, and people have smiles on their face. They want to have a drink after the day at work and, and it's, it's a completely different atmosphere. Absolutely. And I, mean, the, the, um, I think Gil might have the Riesling uh, Von Tardif. Is that right, Gil? It you... is, yes. I'm just struggling yeah. to get my camera on. It might require you, Joe, just to give me that permission back, but <laughs> possibly, but yes. Oh. Um, <laughs> Okay, I don't. Know I am, you won't. Do you won't be able to see me quite yet. But if it comes back on, I am holding the the bottle of uh, Riesling Vendos Tardivius, the 2013, mm -hmm. and thoroughly in the background here, thoroughly enjoying it as I'm listening to you both, um, <laughs> both talking about the wines. It is. Uh, it's tremendous. made. It's made for that sole and only purpose. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> So actually, um, it was when we when we were speaking in uh, when you were over in 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 Bristol, you touched on two thousand and three, another yes. hot summer, um, striking vintage, a, a dry year, and a very and a vintage that that you said marked a bit of a change that we we really started seeing the impact of of climate change and changes in styles. It was it was a click for us. So seventy six was a first click. Seventy six was really the first click where you go, you went from making late harvest wines, high ripeness wines, big opulent, powerful wines was the exception. And seventy six, you went wow, we we can really do it properly. So seventy six, I would say, is the beginning of climate change for us. It's 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 the the it's the it's the it's the way up. It's the it's the it's the improvement curve. Um, and and. To, to, to fully understand that, you have to keep in mind that the condition for a great vintage in Alsace has always been the ripest vintage of the decade will always be the best vintage of the decade. You take, if you want to know what the quality of an Alsace vintage was, you take all of your, all of your, um, all of your uh, uh, records since, uh, since the temperature is being recorded, you take all of the spikes and the spikes are the great vintages. And, and you see it clearly from the library, every single hottest vintage is the best vintage of the decade. The, the, the change was uh, with 2003. 2003, we found out <laughs> that a vintage actually could be overripe, could be too hot, could be too dry. Uh, uh, there could be too much heat in Alsace, and and that was a, a game changer. When 2003 arose, 
we 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 were we were rubbing our hands. We were absolutely convinced this would be the vintage of the century. Mark 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 told me again recently that he was convinced a hundred percent that this would be the vintage of the century, and there was still no rain expected, still no no cold weather expected. So we waited, we waited, waited, waited until mid September, which was normal, you know, at the time. You waited until at least fifteenth, twentieth of September. You would never call your pickers early September. You you always. You, it never happened. There was no risk. There was no chance. And and we actually figured out that over overthinking that that vintage through, we 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 found out that the vines were in shutdown because of heat, which 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 never happened in Alsace. You you never have forty two degrees in Alsace. Now it's it's something that we know can happen. And so the Pinot Noir was stunning. Pinot Noir. It was a Pinot Noir year, and this was also one of those elements that drove us to knowing and understanding that Pinot Noir was a grape for the future. Pinot Noir, it's, 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 it's of massive importance at the moment. Uh, and, and we're actively buying land, planting, trying to find sourcings of Pinot Noir because, because we are absolutely convinced that this is a grape for the future. And when I say for the future, for the next 20 years, because in 20 years time, we might, there are already producers experimenting with Grenache and Syrah because, because they're already, uh, they're already thinking, uh, away uh, uh, another 20 years another 20 years forward it takes 20 years to get the best the best grapes out, out of a vine so yes that is the right time frame um but it's it's, it's, it's one of the the biggest challenges you had there, there are there are lots of um there are lots of things you can do in the meantime in terms of work every year but yes in terms of establish establishing new grapes is to, especially to get top quality wine it's i long-term i i vision you know. I, re I remember a few years ago when Bruno Wettlinger was a grape that was, the, the sales were vertical. Everybody was all about Bruno, 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 Bruno. And I had, a, I had one of my salesperson in, in New York asking me, okay, maybe you should produce a, a Gruner. I say, why? Well, because it's so popular. I say, you, you never want to plant something because it's popular. It's, if it's popular now, in 10 years time, it's not. What do you do? You've planted your vines. They're just in production. And that's it. You're, you, you have those, you have those grapes. You can't do anything with it. So it's, it's, it's why in, in, in wine, always be careful with trends. If something is trendy and everybody speaks about one thing, that is the one thing you shouldn't be buying because the land has gone more expensive. The wines have gone more expensive. And if it's, if it's a, a hot topic, typically, uh, that means that the prices will go up. So this is the case for Pinot Noir right now. The prices are going up. The, the, the land is becoming harder to find because, because limestone soils are actively, actively searched for Pinot Noir, which is exactly what we're doing. And, and it's a great variety that is, that is coming to a, to a, a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a hype. Uh, well, it, it's relative. Huh? It's Alsace hype. It's not. Uh, it's not quite. Uh, it's not quite Burgundy yet. But, but uh, we we are definitely seeing that Pinot Noir is a grape variety. It's the grape variety, if I may call it that way. Pinot Noir and Riesling are the two grape varieties that are beneficiating the most from climate change. And I'm going to add Muscat to the lot, uh, because because Muscat is is a is a grape variety that we still had difficulties ripening ten years ago, and that is not the case anymore. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's really those three grapes that I see having a very very bright future in Alsace, and then give us Germain and Pinot Gris. They will shrink. They will shrink and be, be be concentrated in the most successful areas. They will still obviously always be produced. And and honestly, I think that especially the Sporen is a very good location to be to be growing give us at the moment because it's very resilient to drought, very resilient mm -hmm. to heat. It's a clay vineyard. It's a, it's clay soils. So it's very very resilient to heat, and, and that's, and that's that one be... of the vineyards. That's one of the vineyards that is included in the exhibition Gewurztraminer, for example. And yes. In your, yeah. And in your yes, in that's your that's birth. that is its place of uh, its place of birth, and and well, if you want, that can be a very good link to to terroir. You know, it's if um, if uh, if you want to talk a little bit, uh, if you want to hear a little bit about soils. Uh, this that is, would this be is fantastic, the, and particularly this, the, the, how that relates a, a bit to the different grapes as well. Because if absolutely if, if, if Pinot Gris and, and Gewurz are a, are a little less loved at the moment, a little less appreciated at the moment, it's that's not because it does, they don't make great wine. And and actually, when you were talking uh, when you did the masterclass in Bristol for us, 
you were talking about just how well those, how spectacularly well those wines can age as well. So I think, it, um, you know, they still have a place. They're not going to disappear anytime soon, I, I hope. Uh, and certainly not with Hugo, because you have some fantastic plantings. Absolutely. And and, and the, the big frustration that I have when it comes to Pinot Gris and Gewürztraminer is that it's they're, they're mainly suffering from poor decisions made in the 80s and 90s when when those grapes, well, Pinot Gris was the one grape that you could plant everywhere and it, it was the minimal risk because Pinot Gris is a grape that's, it's the only grape in Alsace which you can produce with the, with Riesling, but Riesling would be a, a something on the side because Riesling is always a finicky grape, whatever whatever happens, wherever you're growing it, Riesling is still is still a grape that demands particular vineyard sites. But Pinot Gris is the, is the only grape variety that wherever you grow it, you'll always be able to make something that you can sell. Meaning if it's under, under ripe, you can make a sparkling. If it's ripe, you can make a dry and, and, and still wine. And if it's if it's overripe, you can make a late harvest. And if it's a bit rotten, then you can pretend it's noble rot. Uh, so um, so uh, whatever happens, you will be able to 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 make money out of your plantings of, of Pinot Gris. And so Pinot Gris has been planted in the wrong area for that reason. At Hugel, we have uh, we can put on maybe the geological map if you want, but we have a. Um, a, a a golden rule, which is that you plant what suits the place, not what you have to sell, and or what sells, and 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 that means at that stage that, of course, you can trade one grape for the other. Typically, you could plant Pinot Gris on the sporan and have have quite good results, if not if not sometimes exceptional results. Uh, at the same time, as as uh, as uh, and, and for example, if you planted Riesling on Sporin, it would be a disastrous, it would be a disaster, it would be a disastrous result. Understand that we have that luxury of choice. When when you talk about Burgundy, you have three main soil types. They're all uh, uh, sedimentary and they're all clay limestone based. And the, the, the main difference is how much uh, uh, silicates and, and how much, uh, how much uh, limestone and how much chalk and how much clay you're going to have. So it's much more a matter of percentage than, than a matter of, of real different soil types. Alsace by itself has 12 different soil types. In Rigvir alone, we have limestone, sandstone, granites, uh, uh, clay, uh, uh, gypsum, gypsum, uh, which would be typically combined with uh, combined with mouths. Um, uh, you will have uh, volcanic soils and all of that comes to the surface in the village of Rigvir. So this geologic map here, it's just Rigvir. It's only Rigvir. If you if you want to have fun, there's um, the French uh, the French government uh, has a has a, um, uh, a website that uh, that uh, has all of the different soil types uh, uh, listed. Uh, the the BR, BRGM BRGM and and the whole geology of France is mapped. And you go across all of the geology of France, and then you zoom on Alsace, and suddenly you have that pocket that is that is a completely different, a complete different structure and a completely different color. And that is Rivière. That is literally Rivière. Rivière has the most diverse geology in the world of wine, which which is absolutely unique. And and so depending on the colors you have here. I'm going to very much generalize, but the pink on the left, that's sandstone, then the light pink, that's limestone, then you hit mouse, so typically yellow, it's Triassic era, so that would be that would be a, a mouse, so the, the yellow part, which especially, especially covers Chenambourg, is mouse with gypsum, which, which make really the uniqueness of, of going to Chenambourg. and then everything that is blue, dark blue and, and, and purple, that would be that would be Jurassic era. That would be clay. Everything that has that orange color that is that is limestone. So uh, uh, calcaire, uh, calcaire en troc. That's the that's the it's it's actually uh, it's actually Comblanchien. It's the, the same uh, the same grapes, the same uh, the same um, uh, limestone as in uh, as in Burgundy and and um, and a uh, good part of Chablis. So uh, 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 you, you have a, a lot of diversity that obviously appeals for very different grape varieties and the, the the fascinating aspect about it is without any notions of geology people still thought that the griffet the, the, the name griffet it means it means a claw a, 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 um, 
um, griffé de, 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 de oysters that we find in the, in the vineyards, the fossils of oysters we find in, in the vineyards, the, 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 the older generations thought they were, thought they were nails or claws from a, from a demon. Uh, so, so people had no idea about geology. Geology, the, the soil was a soil, but they had noticed that soils that looked a little bit different, that looked like, like a, particular, a particular profile, were actually growing certain grapes better. And over 2,000 years of viticulture, people have adapted each grape variety to a different, uh, to a different type of soil. And, and it results in, in seven grapes for the most common, actually, because it's more, it's 13 grapes that we grow in Alsace. Uh, it's actually, it's, it actually results in 13 grapes being grown just for the ones allowed in the appellation. And then you start talking about uh, uh, Grenache, you start talking about, uh, about Syrah. So we already have that opportunity. We have a, a climate that allows us viticulture to a, to a high extent. And we have a geology that allows a complexity of viticulture and, and a, 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 a perfect adaptation to, for, for each grape variety and for each soil. And, and this turns Alsace into probably the most fascinating wine region in, in, in France, but at the same time, possibly also the most complex and sometimes intimidating. It, it's, it's a region that is very easy to, have, to, to get a first glimpse at uh, because we, we, we write the grape on the, on the, on the label. It's, it's as simple as that. If you, if, you're, if you know your grape varieties and it's only seven that you will find most commonly and then probably only three or four that, that you will be drinking on a, on a regular basis if you're not an Alsace fanatic, Alsace is very easy to understand, very easy to apprehend. You know that diverse traminers will have a certain aromatic profile, that reasonings will be a little bit more toned down, high acid and well-structured. So they, 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 um, Alsace is a very easy region to have a first approach of, but as soon as you start, start scratching the surface, Okay, so you have Grand Cruz. Okay, 51 Grand Cruz. Okay, so it's a level of quality. No, it's not only a level of quality. Depending on the soils, they're going to have very different ex expressions. Okay, so you should actually look into which vineyard site is better suited for which grape because it has a, a, a type of soil that tends to, tends to show a little bit better combined with Riesling or, or Pinot Gris. And, and then within Grand Cruz, there are already differences. And this has been... Uh, um, a, a big, uh, a big part of um, of uh, a, a big, a big and long on, ongoing topic in the family. The way the Grand Cru's have been put in place do not guarantee you a uniformity of terroir, and for the for that reason, not a uniformity of quality. So, depending on which producer has has which vineyards in which area of the Grand Cru, you might have a very different expression expression of the of the Grand Cru site. So, if you start going in depth, I would say Alsace is more complex than Burgundy. I, I would agree with you, uh, but, I, but I like the fact that you say that actually to make the first step into Alsace is relatively easy because, yes. you know, the, 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 the wines are variety labelled. If you start at the more modest price end, you're not going to get anything too challenging. Um, but then the more you, you become interested, I mean, you know, if you're a geologist, then just seeing that map will get you excited. Um, exactly. But, but certainly once you start exploring the wines and seeing how the wines express themselves differently in different places and from different producers, um, then it, it's just a, a complete treasure trove. So, I mean, for, for, the, for the real enthusiast, there is just so much there to explore. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It does mean for, for big tastings, you know, a visit can, can, can make for very big tastings. We've done some very big tastings together, which is- a, Guilty, a, a guilty, player. guilty. A, a great, great learning experience. Um, but yeah, it, you you touched on the the, the Grand Cru uh, and the fact that it's only in relatively recent years that that as a family you've adopted the the Grand Cru. So tell us a bit about Grossiloy and how that came about. Grossiloy is basically our own interpretation of uh, of Grand Cru, and uh, and it's more or less an evolution of the Jubilee. If you're if you're familiar, very familiar with our range, you've you've probably had a few bottles of of the Jubilee over the years. We went an extra bit further. It, it's been it's been a long long time. Uh, um, you know, we've we've never adopted the Grand Cru system, or un, until that stage, we haven't adopted the Grand Cru system. 
we had not adopted the Goncourt system because we were in disagreement with the quality standard and, and the, the, the precision of vineyard designation that was, that was, that was in place. So Jubilee was a way to, to demonstrate against the Grand Cru system. Grossiloy was a way to, we've adopted over the years two different approaches. The, the, the approach of the Jubilee was, more, and, and the approach that the older generation, Johnny and, and, and the gener generation of my father had was, they're doing the wrong thing. Uh, they're doing it wrong. They're doing Grand Cru wrong. Um, our approach when when I joined when I joined with the family with the family I joined in 2013 we were already starting to discuss it and 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 it was the wines were more or less already already bottled and blended and bottled the approach we had was if we we should do a step closer to the Grand Cru with the with the Gros Siloy, but to the Grand Cru the way the Hugel see them the way Johnny was, was, was willing to put them in place with the intention that this is how this should be done right. This is Grand Cru to the noble sense of the term. Um, I, I, I always get very, and, and I've, be, I've been getting a lot of that over the past couple of days, I always get extremely frustrated when people tell me, oh, in Alsace, Alsace is a fantastic region, you can get Grand Cru for a very cheap price. And you say, yes, you can, but only if you're interested in what's written on the label and less about what's in the bottle. And, and that's the problem. Alsace has that very complex grid of understanding. If you want to understand Alsace, you, 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 you have to, uh, um, have more entries in your in your in your uh, in your uh, in your uh, Excel file than than just uh, than just two. You know, it it, it, it makes it makes the, the the table much more complicated. Because if you want to fully understand Alsace, you need to know the place, you need to know the grape, you need to know the quality level, quality level and 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 place. Let's put it at the same level because in the case of Grand Cru. It's both a quality level and a mention of origin. And then you need to know the producer because depending on who's producing the wine, you will have a very different expression and a very different quality as well, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, if, you, if you look at Burgundy, there's a lot of homogeneity in the quality of, of Grand Cru's because not everybody can afford to own Grand Cru land. Uh, at one stage, the land costs a fortune. So if you cannot make wines that you value enough when you sell them, you will have to sell the land because when comes the moment of inheriting the land, your children will have to pay millions and millions in, in, in inheritance tax. Uh, it's, it's not the case in Alsace, not at that stage. It's still too much. It's always too much. Paying taxes is always too much. It always feels like too much. But, but, uh, but we're still able to sustained vineyards and sustain a viticulture where people would sell their wines for 10, 15 euro for a Grand Cru. The Burgundians would laugh at you if you tell them that they, they would think you've missed, uh, you, you've misplaced the comma, let's say. You're, you're a, t a couple digits short. I think, I mean, you know, that, that is so true, but I, but I think to give a little bit more context to, to, to the approach that your family has taken, it's, it's been partly because some of the Grand Cru were quite a bit bigger than uh, Johnny Hugel envisaged at the beginning when he was so yes. involved in establishing uh, the appellation, the recognition for, for Grand Cru status. Um, and I think, so your approach has always been to say, right, well, you know, now we are producing those wines. We saw a picture of the, the grossi lawyer that was in the middle of the lineup, but I've, I've got a bottle uh, one of the one of the bottles here, the Gewurz 2012, which we've been selling yes. recently. Um, so you know, you, you moved initially to this name, and then I think it's from the 2015 vintage, mentioning the Grand Cru origins on the label, um, with the intention with the that... principle that they were coming from a much more selective part of the of the Grand Cru vineyard. Yes, we we, we basically take. If, if you want to put up the, the, the map of the, of the estate, we, we're, we have the luxury of choice in the, in the family. And uh, it's true that if you own a tiny piece of land on the Grand Cru site, even though it might not be the best area, you still want to be producing that wine and you still want to be producing it as Grand Cru. And, and unfortunately, you might not get the best quality out of it. We have choice. We have a choice. We have, 
we own uh, uh, 30 hectares of vineyards. Uh, we we own uh, over six and a half hectares of Chenambourg, eight and a half hectares of Sporen, which are which are the two Grand Cru designated vineyards in 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 Rigvier. And so we can we can afford to just select single out the very central part of Chenambourg, the the middle part of of Grand Cru Sporen. And, um, and actually in the spore in the lower part, so the part that is, well, obviously quite a lot of Hugel, uh, is, uh, is, um, is the part that is, that is the, highest, uh, the highest quality. And the Burgundians will, will more or less always agree with the, with the fact that the central section of a vineyard, the, the middle ground is, is um, the, middle, the middle part of the slope is always the, the best part. If you, if you look at the, the, how, a, how a vineyard looks, the, the, the upper part of the slope, uh, uh, which typically would be lighter soils tend to be a little bit too poor in nutrients, too light in nutrients, too light, too light soils, because all of those nutrients have been eroded and, and by water and winds have fallen down slope. And the lower part of the slope collects all of those nutrients and tends to overcrop, uh, overproduce way too rich soils. And it's the middle section that is the best. And it's really with this intention that the Gros Silo was created with the idea of blending that central part of Grand Cru Chenambourg, especially when it comes to Riesling, which, which is the, the area that, that has always, as long as we've been vinifying Parcellaire and as long as we've been looking at grapes in the vineyards and, and checking on, on our viticulture, it's always been the best, the best parts of the estate. And then the Plochtik, which is very underrated because not classified. Once again, you have some vineyards that are classified as Grand Cru that are probably not worthy of the status in Alsace, and you have vineyards that are not, which uh, which uh, well you can name the the, the Clovins Bull from from Olivier Umbrecht. You can you can name a few of those very high quality vineyards. The Prostik is one of them, which which produces wines that that are not AOC wines. They're they're proper terroir wines, and uh, and this is actually where we produce our best uh, our best Pinot Noir. So this is a this is a place of strategic importance in 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 the near future. I think you're on uh, yeah, yes to meet. Thank you. I'm conscious that um, that time is moving on, so we probably should should move on a little bit. We've 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 talked about some of the trends. The fact that you know the demand for Riesling is high. There's a bit less demand for Gewurz and Pinot Gris, but perhaps unfairly because they still produce some of the greatest wines that that Alsace produces and some of the longest lived. Agreed. Um, Pinot Noir very much on the up. Um, but interesting almost almost too much yeah yeah too much demand um so yes if you're a, a, a tip if you're enjoying Alsace Pinot Noir uh, and, and find one that you particularly like buy it now because the prices are probably going to be going up in the next few years uh, especially if it's a it's a it's an age-worthy wine um especially in the single vineyards don't don't yeah. worry too much about the about the AOC wines uh, they they will remain affordable. We're we're Alsace. We're not Burgundy. We have learned our lesson, the, the lesson that others of the mistakes that others others have made for us. But but the single vineyard Pinot Noirs, yes, they're they, they are they are on the rise. This this demand that is increasing and 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 the prices are going up, which will come of course with with an improvement in its culture. You know when 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 you have wines that that uh, that Im improve in quality people see more more uh, more interest in buying and when people buy at a, at a better price there's always an investment in the in the production and reduction of yields etc cetera, etc cetera. of course yeah absolutely and so the we, we've touched on elements of the future for alsace we've touched about touched on the fact that climate change whilst it's a challenge it's something that is very is very much front of mind. There are it'll be the, to the benefit of some grapes, trickier for others, but at least you're all very very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a there's 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 still plenty of plenty of future uh, ahead for, for for Alsace. We're not going to see those those wines disappear anytime soon. Um, I, I I sincerely hope not. Then, in in all honesty. Frost was never an issue for us. Frost was never an issue for us. Uh, with the milder springs that we've had, it's it's starting to be something that we're more and more concerned about. Uh, mm -hmm. 
we we've had frost again a couple of a uh, couple of uh, nights ago. Um, we don't know exactly how much, but we've lost some crop already. So so it, it is an increasing concern and. and Counterintuitively, intuitively, the, the the warmer the climate, the more frost will become will become a, a worry and a and a challenge. Alsace is always rather a late budding a late budding area, because northern climate. But mm -hmm. but uh, late budding uh, in uh, the twenty first century still means that by by the by mid March we're we're out. The buds are open. The, the vines are the vines are growing. I mean, certainly when when Fiona and I were with you and 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 in Alsace only a week ago, it was. It was very noticeable how advanced the vineyards were, and people were commenting, you know, that they'd been away for a week or so, and and really seen a, a change in the vineyards there. Which is, yeah, I think it's it is a it is a concern. Um, let's hope that uh, you don't find that the damage has been too great. We certainly don't don't want that. We could do with a nice a nice quality and quantity of of, of harvest twenty twenty four. That would be that would be good news. We'll that take it. Be good news, absolutely. Um, and one very significant thing that we haven't touched on is that you have gradually been working towards organic uh, mm -hmm. viticulture. Some of your vineyards are already fully organic, um, and and seeing really seeing an improvement in in not only an improvement in quality but an improvement in consistency of quality. Which I yes that is such a strong argument for for it i i would say that is probably the most massive edge uh both with climate change actually and 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 organic viticulture uh, vintage uh, uh climate climate change definitely warmer warmer climate definitely makes the wines more consistent so we're definitely seeing on especially the simpler wines that the quality has absolutely skyrocketed uh, and then and then when it comes to the top wines it's really it's really organic viticulture without a doubt that has that has uh, that has massively improved the wines um, both quality and consistency we we've done the first attempts with organic viticulture in 2004 um, 2007 the first vineyard was well unofficially but what but was finishing its conversion it was shellhammer and um, and from there uh, we've seen the results of a, a vineyard that was that was at the time uh, 15 years old was showing better than 60 70 years old vineyards so so that's it you, you, without without a doubt you're you're uh, you're you know where it comes from that that is the only part that has that had that had changed in our in our viticulture so we very quickly implemented it to the rest of the Grand Cru sites uh, 2012 at that stage it was still it was still um, uh, not um, not uh, not claimed as organic so it was it was practices and not uh, and not uh, a stamp of a stamp of approval uh, and so we're in official conversion because it's always you have to understand that in viticulture whatever happens it's always the the last five percent that are that that are the hardest part it's uh, it's uh, it's it's always the last remaining four three four five hectares that were very old vines that were still planted you still have some 80 years old 90 years old vineyards that were planted at the time when when we were still plowing by horse or with an ox so so uh, so uh, uh, before before we had a tractor and it's those last vineyards that produce the best wines in the best part of the of the of the vineyards that that are um, that are actually the hardest to to, to to turn to organic viticulture so it, it was I think it's I think it's also because um, the, the older vines are more sensitive so do so you have to you have to have to tackle them with sensitivity so yes you don't want to risk shocking the vine you have to move slowly gradually um, taking all of that into account but it's but it's exciting to see and how that hopefully will help to sustain those older vines a bit longer too which will also be a, a wonderful what thing. we what we find especially interesting and and uh, and this is something that that has really striked us in a great vintage the wines were always great but it's the it's the simpler vintages the ones that were a little mm -hmm. bit more challenging a little bit less ripe there's still more juice more depth more density and this we absolutely notice it without a doubt the second most interesting aspect with with organic viticulture it's that in a in a warmer climate in a climate that is increasing in heat we have seen Gewurztraminer actually rise in acidity, and 
this is extremely interesting in our case. This, this is a massive game changer for us. We've actually seen levels of acidity rise again, uh, especially on Giverse Terminal, which, which, uh, which, which obviously makes it a couple... It, it, it changes everything. A grape variety that we thought was doomed is still continuing to increase in, in, in acidity and, and, and that, that changes everything. Yeah, and and just to just to add to that for anyone who is not um, already a, a, a confirmed Alsace nut, that that Gewurztraminer is typically very low in acidity, yes. and so with climate change, one of the concerns is that you, it, it's harder and harder to make the drier styles, um, uh, and have enough acidity to, to to have a balance in the wine. So you know that's that's fantastic news. It's it's wonderful to to hear. I, I would say that at that stage. At that stage, the, the, the biggest difficulty with climate change is less acidity levels than, than alcohol, alcohol, sugar balance. Alcohol, mm -hmm. sugar balance is really, really was what has become more tricky. And, and you can't, at some stage, you cannot harvest earlier. If you harvest too early, you're going to miss the phenolics. You're going to have underdeveloped aromatics, underdeveloped phenolics. And, and that's, that's not taking you anywhere. It's, it's making a dry wine to make a dry wine. It's 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 not in our DNA. We've always mm -hmm. prided ourselves with uh, with with making dry wines, but when at some stage you cannot produce a bone dry wine, you probably should not. And this is why Gewurztraminer has seen increasing levels of residual sugar. If you if you taste uh, uh, if you have a bottle of the Society's uh, exhibition Gewurztraminer, it's 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 risen five six eight grams of residual sugar in, in, in the past 10 or 15 years, probably 15 years. But, but it's because you can pick earlier until you cannot anymore. And you can ferment drier until you cannot anymore. We're not trying to make wines that are 15 and a half or 16% of alcohol. So, so balance is everything, of course. And, and, and we try to make wines that keep that freshness and keep that structure and where in, in, in that case, increasing levels of acidity are a great help, but more of more important than everything we want depth and concentration yeah and we haven't even touched on the food matching which you're so good at making those kind of recommendations so we'll, we'll have to we'll have to organize a, a, another session at some stage in the, in the future so that we can we can get a bit more of that because i think some of the some of the the the, the styles that have a bit of sweetness which as we know calms down with time in bottle you know if you keep the wine for any length of time but sometimes yes. that really that really complements a style of food as well so Absolutely. that's a whole it's a whole a whole extra extra subject um gil are there any is there anything that's come up as a question that we haven't that you think we haven't covered well there are so there are there are three or four questions actually there've been quite a few on one particular area or or fairly so I kind of paraphrase mm -hmm. and put them all together but the first question I have here that's come in um, on the chat is is just wondering your views jean frederic on um, oxoa as a varietal uh, not a variety that we've spoken about throughout or, or sort of detailed in terms of this evening and possibly for um Alsace masterclass take 2 as as you say there's lots more to cover uh, but yeah just your uh, quick your views on the great variety that is an excellent question because typically Oxerwa, you see it very little in Alsace. It, it's there, it's very planted, but you see it very little because it's 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 a great variety. It's one of those incredible uh, French extract exceptions. You know, we have exceptions in our language. Language we also have them in our viticulture. Um, Oxerwa is actually a grape that you can legally call a Pinot Blanc. Uh, typically, most Pinot Blancs are are a, a co-fermentation of of Pinot Blanc and Oxerwa. Most of the time, we don't even exactly no producers don't exactly know the percentage of Auxerrois in their, in their Pinot Blanc. What we're definitely seeing though, is that Auxerrois is one of those grapes that is doomed in Alsace. Without a doubt for me, it, it takes all the boxes. It is high ripeness, so high sugar, high sugar content, low acidity, and high sugar content, low acidity in a grape that is replaceable. And by the way, replaceable with pure Pinot Blanc, proper proper Pinot Blanc. That, that to me is a sign that, uh, that this grape probably is uh, is living its last uh, its last days uh, its last days in Alsace. It's a great variety that used to be planted, especially in 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 the 80s and 70s and 60s, in order to reinforce and restructure a little bit Pinot Blanc. Now it's something that is absolutely not needed anymore. Okay. 
Um, the uh, the sort of yes, the power phrase question. I suppose I'll try and, and summarize the question in a little bit. And I'm not quite sure it could have a huge answer to it. So this is a bit of a challenge in the sort of five minutes or so we have left on the on the session. But um, what would what would be your sort of describe if you're describing the key differences between uh, an Alsace dry riesling, um, for example, against you know in comparison to other dry rieslings from elsewhere, say German dry riesling or or from elsewhere in 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 the the wine producing world, what would be those key differences for you? I'm I'm going to tackle uh, Australia first, and and Austria Aus, Australia and Austria a little bit at the same time because the, the profile of wines are, are are actually by far not similar, of course, but 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 to me to me have that that same that same common point that they're much warmer climate, if I may call them that way, uh, uh, wines meaning that they they'll typically a little bit more be a little bit more terpenic you'll have a little bit more of that of that petrol character uh, you'll have uh, a little bit more of that of those heat driven or 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 drought driven uh, uh, aromatics which which would be uh, which would be quite defining i think austria is one of those places where you cannot dry farm anymore for example uh, australia pretty much the same so that would be uh, um, the, the first thing that comes to mind for me when when describing those those two wine regions so really if you have a very a very petroly by lack of a, of a better word and i actually love to to call to call a cat a cat you know uh, uh, as we say in french i don't know how good that translates in english but but there's, <laughs> there's always that that very terpenic flinty minerality that 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 very much expresses like like uh, gasoline tennis balls or 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 uh, or uh, or um, or a uh, or, uh, plasticky rubbery character, which I absolutely love in wine. And, and, and I'm not saying Alsace wines don't have it. Typically, Alsace wines will have will tend to have them a little bit less and depending on the soil types as well. You'll find it a little bit more on granite, typically. You'll find it a little bit more on high drainage uh, vineyards. But, but typically, those would be a little bit more driven by, by hotter, warmer vintages or hotter climates, which, which is typically in average more the case in, in Austria and Australia. And then there's, there's a very different uh, um, uh, philosophical, there's a very big philosophical difference between uh, Germany and, and Alsace, I would say. Uh, first of all, the Germans tend to drink wine outside of a meal more often. We're, we're, we're foodies, you're, you know the French, we'll, we'll have wine at the table typically. Uh, and, and, and German Rieslings tend to be more often seen as, Riesling in Germany tends to be more often seen a, a little bit as an aromatic grape, uh, which is not the case in Alsace. In Alsace, we do not consider Riesling as an aromatic grape. We consider it as a minerality structure driven wine that will be a food wine. If you ask to any Alsace producer, when you tell them about Riesling, how they like to drink Riesling, they'll always tell you a dish. By default, they'll always tell you a dish. The Germans have a much more of that culture to, to actually drink more beer with food and, and wine wine as an aperitif. So, and, and, and once again, going back to the fact that we don't see Riesling as an aromatic grape, we have Gewürztraminer. Gewürztraminer, everybody thinks it's a German grape. No, it's an Alsace grape, 100%. And... and Germany produces Germany as a whole, as a whole country produces much less given Australia than Alsace. Um, so it's it's really our grape and it's 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 a very aromatic grape variety. If you've never had a given Australia, uh, stick your nose in the glass. If you can't smell anything, you have COVID. And it's 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 obvious, it's a very obvious wine. Um, and so we have given Australia, we have an aromatic grape. We do not use Riesling as an aromatic grape and to produce aromatic wines. And actually, to to add to that, that's that is fully supported by your policy, which is actually to allow the wine some bottle age. So your, when you release your wine, so for example, your estate Riesling is currently 2019 vintage. Yep. You re release those wines when they've already passed those initial primary aromatic characters, and they've already started to get into the much more complex minerality, bit more texture, bit more breadth on the on the palate as well. So. Yeah, it, it 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 fully displays the the that point of view. I think there are some modest rieslings in Alsace in Alsace which go the more lighter aromatic style. Yes. Um, but yeah, I can I can totally see where you're coming from. But yes, as as a as a riesling enthusiast or student, it's not an easy one to 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 tackle. And um, you know, 
the best way to do it is to is to get a good example make sure you get a good example of each line them up and then yeah. and then i think you know a lot of what what jean frederic has has said will will uh, will fall into place i think it i think it helps mm -hmm. enormously now we probably i'm i'm sorry to say we probably need to start thinking about winding up um, yes we'll just see the time <laughs> which is a great which is a great shame um there are a couple of other things that I particularly wanted to say. I mean, I've in my time at the Wine Society, I think I only started uh, working with Alsace again because I had worked with Alsace in the past. But um, uh, Marcel handed Alsace over to me, I think, in from 2015. So it hasn't been a long, long time, but it has been an absolute pleasure. And the Hugel family have been an absolute joy to work with. Um, I feel very confident indeed that that long relationship that we, the Wine Society, has with Hugel is going to continue into the next generations. It's it's wonderful to know that that you and your cousin Marc Andre, who is who is involved on the on the winemaking side, you now have children of your own, so that the uh, the, the 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 future is secure with the following generations, as it is with us, because. Um, our new colleague Fiona, who sadly wasn't able to join us this evening, but was able to to, to be with with me uh, on on my last visit to see you in in, in oh, really? introduce Fiona. So Fiona Hayes, our new colleague, is taking over Alsace and uh, was delighted on um, uh, to to, uh, to come across a, a an Alsace Gewurztraminer and a blind tasting this week. So she was she was well placed to to spot it uh, <laughs> after after our visit. So that was good. Um, so. Uh, I mean, it, it's a pleasure for me to see the fact that she she's now met met you, um, revisited Alsace, which where she hadn't been for a few years. Um, she's looking forward to it enormously, and I am confident that it's in good hands. That the relationship will continue to be a strong one, and we will continue to see wonderful wines coming from from Hugel and elsewhere in Alsace. Uh, which I will certainly continue to, to enjoy personally. Um, so thank you so much, Jean Frederic, for your time yet again. And uh, not only have we imposed on you just getting off a plane, we imposed on you a few weeks ago on your birthday, and now it's a Friday night. So <laughs> I think we probably we probably um, tested your patience somewhat so to uh... put 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 that way. You you make it not sound like it, but it is a pleasure. Well, you're you're very kind, and um, thank you so much for your time and to your family once again for for allowing us your time so kindly. Um, it's been great to see you. Thank you so much for your insights uh, and that wonderful history of, of 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 Alsace, which it just gives us such a such an amazing perspective for for that fantastic region. And to those of you listening, if you haven't visited, do please go. Um, it's it's a, a very beautiful but fascinating place as we've been hearing. So lots to learn, and I hope that you continue to uh, to enjoy doing so. Again, we thank have you a... so much for uh, for managing us through the through the process and the um, the odd technical difficulty, but we got there in the end. One or two there. I, I will just also add, you know, huge um, credit there, Jean Frederic, as well. The professionalism of continuing to to deliver the presentation despite all that's going on in the background. <laughs> there uh, i feel like i'm in the airport with you there as well it's been fascinating sort of insight into into that particular part of the world uh the members thank you yeah for me thank you for joining us this evening joe thank you as well for your for your time your insights uh it's i've been sitting here fascinated by everything that we've been talking busy scribing things down and enjoying enjoying a glass as well <laughs>